Yeah, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we will start at three o'clock. It's about two more minutes left. I can see a lot of people joining in. We got our uh, speakers already uh, with us. So uh, we will try to start only at three o'clock. Thank you very much for being here. And um, I, um, we are looking forward for a, a great participation from the, the, the audience also. And please ensure that you keep your mics muted during um, presentations. And uh, we will definitely take your questions towards the end of the uh, online meeting. Participants, please mute your mics. Manish, could you please confirm Vivek is available? Yes, I'm sure. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Uh, we need your camera on. All right. My camera on. Thank you, Vivek ji. Uh, Vivek ji, Riket is already there, and uh, we are at uh, three o'clock. We can start. I hope. Good afternoon. Everyone, I, I good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we are um, discussing uh, cyber wildlife crime and the Wildlife Trust of India's effort to counter wildlife crime in the online world using certain tools. And uh, today we have uh, uh, speakers from India, speakers from Netherlands, France, and United States. They will be sharing their experiences fighting wildlife crime in uh, various places and uh, uh, i would uh, i am not uh, i would like to invite our speakers and uh, um, i would like to invite uh, mr vivek menon who is the founder and trustee and executive director of wildlife trust of india is a counselor at iucn and he's a deputy chair of iucn ssc and uh, asian elephant group 
I don't think Vivek needs a lot of um, introduction to an Indian or international audience. And um, I would like to Vivek ji to uh, give an opening remarks about the wildlife crime and uh, what is the need for fighting wildlife crime. Yeah, thanks, Jos. Uh, and thank you for introducing me with all my various capture titles. Uh, what you probably didn't say is why I'm here. Uh, it's, it's not uh, only because I'm the founder of the Wildlife Trust of India, which is hosting this, but because I've had a deep and engaging passion in uh, enforcement of wildlife crime um, for the last 35 odd years. By odd years. in India in 1990. Real method in the country to look at wildlife crime in a more uh, structured manner. Uh, I have been involved in some way or the other in, in this world of uh, wildlife crime monitoring. Now, uh, the world over, moving away, one step away from wildlife crime, but in the world over of, of uh, wildlife conservation, in the broader world of science, and the broader world of, of citizens' uh, engagement in these issues, citizen science has emerged as one of the most important uh, mechanisms where the specialist interacts with uh, the generalist who has passion and, and combines a skill towards a common goal. Uh, and this, uh, for example, if you look at a very sim simple thing of bird watching, uh, many years ago people used to go bird watching uh, in their in their patches and 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 gardens. Scientists used to do it in their research sites, but there was no way of communication between the two. Till somebody put up a wonderful platform called eBird, and now we have millions of people, whether they are uh, a father taking the children for a walk or a scientist doing a PhD now contribute things through that uh, platform uh, in a way in which data can be assimilated and analyzed globally, uh, as well as the, the person who's contributing it uh, has uh, several technological ways of easing his own record keeping and his own ability of knowing what he has seen, where, when, et cetera, et cetera. A wonderful small uh, uh, platform. The uh, SSC, which as uh, Somebody seems to have muted me from, from the control. So there's clearly somebody who does not want me to speak, but I'm, I've try, I'm trying to <laughs> unmute myself to get back. Right, so um, I'm, I'm saying uh, the red list is, is one of the most important scientific ways of assessing a species threat. And even there, now we are trying uh, through the SSC to see how citizen science platforms can actually inform scientists in a way that they can make better distribution maps, that they can make better uh, threat analysis to the species uh, than we do with only specialists gathering uh, expert data at a given point of time. So I think today we are gathered uh, to, to uh, launch, uh, celebrate, uh, call it what you may, a, a technology called CyberHawk, a technology-based tool basically, uh, called CyberHawk, which follows exactly the same principle. The principle is that crime, wildlife crime, like any other crime, happens all around us. It does not happen only around enforcement agencies. It doesn't happen only around the specialist. It happens around the citizen. And, and people can, can uh, find wildlife crime uh, that happens in this case in the cyberspace because there are millions of us trawling the net for a million purposes, whether it's ordering food or watching films or, or Googling or, or whatever else. And as we troll, we may come across uh, instances of illegality of wildlife crime uh, and any common citizen 
can then take that one step action to, to report it. But, but unlike uh, it just being a satisfying thing for that person who posts it on Facebook or Twitter uh, and then gets two replies, here this tool will then allow analysis to proceed to the next level. I, I, neither do I know the, the technicalities uh, of, of the tool, and nor do I want to spoil uh, Joe's um, presentation or any of your presentations, which will uh, elaborate it in detail. All I want to say is this, this sort of uh, technological advance that will A, help us get much more information uh, on wildlife crime that happens through a large um, geography, even purely nationally, if you look at it, India is a very large geography. We're the size of Europe without the Soviet Union. It's a very large geography. So when, when you look at that nationally, it's very important to have all these people reporting in. But as Joe's would tell you, that even in the small, when this was field tested, uh, the Wildlife Trust of India's uh, Wildlife Crime Control Division, uh, along with uh, national enforcement authorities, have done more than 14 operations based on citizen uh, input into this system, which is still being field tested. And in one occasion, even uh, had an international uh, operation conducted in a neighboring country um, through, through it's gathered through the system. Uh, so as, as a result, um, none of this is national really. The moment we, we are talking cyber, the moment we talk the World Wide Web, we are instantly international. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that whatever we launch here today, uh, whatever all the experts are going to discuss here today is as uh, uh, as uh, pertinent to controlling wildlife crime in the Americas or Southeast Asia or Africa as in India. This may well be developed here, but I, I do hope that both in, the, in its use here itself, there will be international ramifications. And I do hope that this will inspire other such uh, tools to be developed in various places and we can all uh, use them to curb this uh, very, very worrying uh, crime, which, as you know, is not only a, a crime in, in, in that it contravenes law, but it's a crime that could take away a species forever. So I, I congratulate uh, Joe's and team for, for developing this system, uh, especially all the, all the software developers who assisted uh, in the back end, as they say, in developing this team. At this tool, and I welcome the four speakers who are going to speak today, who I would also uh, like to listen to, and all of you participants. I can see quite a large participation list, so I welcome all of you uh, to today's function. Thank you very much, and over to you. Thank you, Vivek ji, and uh, uh, of course, uh, you inspired us. I would like to say that you and Ashok ji actually inspired me personally a lot. And uh, it is uh, handing, uh, handing over the, the, the responsibility to the next generation. And with the cyber tool, I think we are getting the, 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 the 2000 plus uh, uh, generation uh, to fight wildlife crime. And the, the, the methodologies are changing. The, the arena is changing, as you said correctly, as I remember you telling about stories of uh, working on uh, elephant ivory trade and tracking tiger traders. And uh, now these, these same kind of trade is happening over internet where uh, a person, person sitting in Thailand is connecting with somebody in India over a WhatsApp chat and doing trade. So the trade is changing and it is our response uh, to the changing uh, scenario and the changing challenges in wildlife crime. And thank you very much for inspiring a whole generation of us. And uh, we would like to take it forward to the next generation. And uh, as you said, we will we will keep fighting this uh, as long as we can. And we will take it forward. Thank you very much, Vivek ji. And uh, with that, I would uh, like to introduce uh, Tricia. Um, uh, uh, Tricia will be talking to us about uh, about wildlife crime and uh, associated financial uh, criminal activities. Uh, Tricia Rexter is uh, an analyst with United for Wildlife, 
and uh, she is a specialized uh, she's a specialist in finding the financial linkages in wildlife crime which is a very very important aspect because whenever there is a criminal activity happening there is a lot of money changing hands so you you have an expert who who understand uh, this complex network of financial crime and uh, wildlife uh, financial and wildlife crime over to you uh, trisha Thank you, Joseph, and thank you all so much for having me. I, I met Joseph about a year ago and became familiar with the work of the Wildlife Trust of India then and have been endlessly impressed since that time. So thanks for this opportunity. It's exciting to be part of the launch of the Cyber Spotter today. So I'm going to try to figure out how to skip, share my screen. So I, it'll be immediately obvious I'm not a data scientist. <laughs> so give me one second, see if I can figure it out. Um, I think it's this one. Can you all see my screen? Oh, I have. I yes, Trisha, we can see your screen. Go ahead. Great. Great. So, um, you know, when Joe asked me to speak today about challenges uh, to cyber wildlife crime, that's kind of the perfect topic for me. We've been, I've been having, like I said, I'm not a data scientist. Uh, you know, I don't understand that side of what they've done. It's just amazing to me that it's even possible to develop a tool like this. Um, but I am in a unique position as an analyst with Focus Conservation and United for Wildlife. Uh, we're constantly in these conversations and trying to figure out and get ahead of, of these criminals that are uh, just tremendously creative, always coming up with new ways to traffic wildlife. Uh, I'm also part of a National Science Foundation grant in the United States. And through this grant, we are trying to um, craft research questions that can help drive science and help drive the, the science to help us, again, understand wildlife crime and how to combat it, whether it's criminology, data science, uh, conservation science, Etc. So again, uh, these thoughts and comments are, you know, all mine, just based on conversations I've had over the last year or so about this topic, um, and hopefully they're helpful. So let me. Oh, I was able to do it. So here's my agenda, just basically what we'll talk about. Some of this may be familiar to many of you, and then others, uh, you know, hopefully it's a little bit new information. Um, oh. Oh, gosh, I'm going the wrong way. I've never shared my screen before. One time only. Well, that was my whole presentation. <laughs> well, let me get back to the beginning. Okay, so here's the, the hard part. When we really think about the volumes of trade involved, right, that's when uh, this crushing weight of this problem should really become obvious, right? It's not just wildlife trafficking. It's a wildlife trade overall. And the wildlife trade is absolutely massive. You know, just in the United States, we import four, over four and a half billion dollars worth of live animals every year involving at least 200 million individual animals. That's just live animals. I can't even fathom how many animal products we import. You know, so just the task of sorting out, you know, which animals may be are, are possibly being traded illegally versus which, uh, you know, other animals that, that are part of a clean, you know, supply chain we can all be proud of. It's a tremendous challenge. And we know too that wildlife crime itself is now growing at five to 7% a year. That's a faster than the global economy because there's so much money to make, be made. And it's actually, uh, surprisingly easy to traffic wildlife. It's a super lucrative. It's easy. It's a worldwide market, you know, incredibly difficult to combat. Uh, out of the CITES listed species, we have 35,000, maybe almost 40,000 species listed under CITES. Right now, almost 6,000 are traded. Those are just CITES listed species. Uh, conservationists expect another 3,000 listed species to be in the trade in the coming years. And again, those are just CITES species, that there is an untold number of other species being traded. So given what we know about the risk to disease, biodiversity loss, habitat loss, hands, uh, landscapes, uh, interwoven nature of ecosystems, uh, the scope and scale of demand, uh, we need to really appreciate how big this trade is and come up with creative solutions like the Wildlife Trust of India has done. We'll learn more about today to combat this. Um, obviously now with the global pandemic caused by uh, zoonotic disease, it, it should be, you know, obvious. So the next challenge oh, 
is the supply chain, right? It's actually, so now we, you know, if we can frame this problem as a, you know, it's global in scope, the, the volume of trade is tremendous. So then the next question is, how do you tell if a species is being laund or is being traded legal or illegally, it's actually very difficult to tell. You know, I think sometimes that we'll look back on rhino horn trafficking and ivory trafficking and wish, you know, it were that easy still, right? Because it's often uh, not super challenging to figure out if a rhino horn trade is illegal. Of course, it is. Uh, it's illegal to trade rhino horn almost everywhere, but lizards. They are legal somewhere. They're illegal another place. They they illegality slips in all across the supply chain. So it makes it very difficult for law enforcement and practitioners to tell and for consumers to tell what's going on. Are they making a, a conscious good choice or are they buying an animal that that it has illegality at every level of the supply chain. So just quickly to go through this, because I think it's it's kind of a, a pretty well-known aspect of wildlife crime. Uh, so there's a lot of illegality that can occur at the point of origin, right? So animals can be harvested illegally. They could be captured in protected areas. Maybe banned methods are used. So an animal that is actually legal to trade can still have illegality in the way it was harvested. Um, maybe the trafficker or the, the hunter exceeded the quotas that year. Uh, maybe it's been laundered through a breeding facility as, uh, you know, sold as or marketed as, as captive bred and in reality this is a wild caught animal you know lots of ways at the point of point of origin then in transit again so many opportunities for organized crime and for another class of criminals that i've just learned this phrase in the last year called a green collared criminals so people who are using or businesses who are using legitimate seeming uh, businesses to traffic wildlife everything looks legal. Again, it's so difficult for a consumer or law enforcement to tell that, you know, half of the products in a pet store have been procured illegally, right? It's a store. It has a, a presence. You know, the owners often have uh, expert understanding of laws and rules and regulations on how to file documents, how to move species across transna international borders or trans transnational borders without having them stopped. Because they have this expertise in the legitimate side of the trade, they use that expertise then to, uh, you know, make animals that that have that were caught illegally or, or being trafficked to illegally look legal. At the point of destination to tremendous challenges, again, for consumers, wildlife trafficking is almost, or it's not almost always, it's very often transnational. So laws, of course, in jurisdictions then become a real challenge for law enforcement and, again, for consumers and anyone, and for cyber spotters, right? Because uh, jurisdictions change, laws change, they're uneven laws. Just because a species is protected in Africa, it may not be protected in India. I know in Europe, actually, it's uh, it's incredibly ch and challenging when traffickers can smuggle species into Europe, but oftentimes those species are not protected from the trade in Europe because they're not native species. Um, it creates a real challenge, again. So all of these things are just in the in the physical supply chain where we can kind of see animals moving through the system. And there are, are in some instances, opportunities to understand what's going on. But even then, this is probably too simplistic of a of a depiction of wildlife trafficking. Uh, I think it's becoming increasingly obvious that we need to understand in a more complex and nuanced way how these uh, criminal networks and networks in general uh, are moving species. Again, because so many are commingled, right? So they're criminal networks that look like uh, legitimate businesses. Uh, we have to understand uh, how these these supply chains are organized in a much more nuanced way. And I think we're really lacking that. So again, just another challenge. And then IWT in the virtual space, which is really something I've only looked at 
for the last year or so. And it is, again, it's mind boggling, especially when we consider the scope of the trade, the volume of trade and the transnational borderless nature of the internet. You know, now all of those challenges that we saw with IWT in the physical space are even more challenging in the virtual space because we don't understand jurisdictions always. It's not always easy to tell what uh, species is being traded. Is it a legal species? Is it illegal? What does a picture signify online? You know, maybe it's just a picture. Uh, how do we determine that? You know, it's incredibly challenging. And we, uh, all those challenges are exacerbated by the websites and the technologies themselves, of course, because they're trying to keep users on their site. Uh, they've developed all these algorithms, you know, that drive the clicks, the clickbait, as we call it, these algorithms that end up uh, supposedly inadvertently, but, you know, it's, it's clearly part of the business model, right, to keep people on these sites, but the algorithms drive traffickers together. They allow them to or enable them to meet one another, to chat, to talk. Now, so many platforms are moving towards encryption. It's going to make it even more challenging to understand what's happening uh, as wildlife moves through these domains. And I think a really big challenge when we think about the physical space where wildlife trafficking is occurring, you know, in real life, so to speak, versus a virtual space, is where do those large-scale traffickers interact? Where are they meeting the folks that are selling, uh, you know, ivory bracelets or, you know, smaller volumes of wildlife online or a variety of wildlife through stores online? Where are they meeting? You know, that it's really difficult to tell. I have a colleague in Vietnam who explained to me that as much work as he's done looking at the online trade in Vietnam and the real life trade, right? Because Vietnam is a huge transit hub for uh, massive shipments of pangolin scales, ivory, you know, rhino horn, these products from Africa. But it's very difficult to tell where these large transnational traffickers in the transit phase are connected to folks trading online, uh, these online retailers. So there's a big gap in knowledge in that area. It's, it's a, a tremendous challenge. And I don't think that I don't think they've cracked that nut yet. So again, hopefully this is something, you know, as we get more data and more folks looking at all these different aspects of the trade, maybe we can figure out where these linkages occur. And then just briefly, I'll mention another, another aspect of online sales are these business to business marketplaces. These I don't think get much attention because they uh, are probably often hosting fake and fraudulent ads for wildlife products. Um, these sites will often advertise just out in the open, you know, tiger bone, rhino horn, tiger claws, uh, pangolin scales, ivory. You know, these are, are products that are clearly illegal. So most likely what's happening is these are advanced fee fraud schemes. But my fear is that wildlife that is less obviously illegal, right? Where the trades converge, where there's a parallel legal and illegal trade. Uh, these sites are not monitoring at all products that we know are illegal, right? So what are they doing for these other species that, that this gray area occurs where we know so much of the uh, wildlife trafficking is occurring? It's, it's a, a serious problem that I think deserves, in my mind, much more attention. So let me see if I can, oh, and so my next slide. Uh, this is a question that comes up a lot about the data, right? So there are, there are some kind of competing ideas in, in, and we're both, we're all right about this. You know, there's a lot of data and information about wildlife crime. I'm often in conversation with other NGOs, uh, law enforcement, and they'll tell me, we know exactly who's doing this. We know the names of people trafficking. We know, you know, what they're trading, where they're going. We know the species involved. Um, you know, we have all this fantastic NGO reporting. It's tremendous. Um, at the same time, there are lots of gaps. You know, we don't always know. Uh, we rely on old trade data too often. Uh, a lot of species have been unassessed. The financial data, you know, Joseph was giving me too much credit. It's actually very difficult to get financial data and to do uh, analysis of the typologies of uh, transactions between 
you know, the transactions that look suspicious that, to develop any kind of criminal profiles. It's incredibly difficult. It's hard to find lists of offenders, even when people are named in media, even when they've been convicted, sometimes repeat offenders, it's often very hard to find their names. Um, we, again, it's a poorly understood trade dynamic. So at the same time, we have a lot of information, you know, we still have these gaps, you know, both those things are true at the same time. Uh, but I think the bigger problem is the connectivity, you know, so even again, where we know what's going on, getting that information to somebody who can do something about it is often the hardest part. You know, NGOs are sometimes unwilling to share information. They may be fearful that naming and shaming actual individuals, you know, naming somebody for committing wildlife crime could make them liable or, you know, cause cause legal litigation challenges for themselves. They may be worried about their donor streams. Um, often we don't know who to call. Even within an agency, folks don't know who to talk to. So in the transnational space, it's even more difficult. I know in my own U.S. government, I love being an American. I love my government. I love my Fish and Wildlife Service. We often have challenges figuring out, you know, who do I call when I have this information? Would love to see data science solve that problem. And again, I think that that this tool Joseph and his team have developed really could go a long way to doing that. So it's tremendously challenging because the when we're not getting information to the right people, uh, we're we're limiting our ability to disrupt trafficking. So if law enforcement doesn't understand or doesn't know where to go or who to who to look at, you know, they're not conducting investigations, they're not arresting people. If we're not sharing information with financial institutions and transport companies, they're not going to know who to apply extra scrutiny to uh, in terms of their customer base, who to look at more closely, what routes to look at, what, uh, you know, what are the red flags. If we're not sharing this information with them, and if we're not sharing it with our partners and the diplomatic corps and our embassies overseas, you know, there are so many um, other kind of non-law enforcement mechanisms to combat wildlife crime, like visa restrictions and, you know, uh, that sort of thing. If we're not getting the information to the folks who can do something about it, we're really missing a golden opportunity. So I'll just try to move quickly through this because I think I'm probably way over my time. But I've been really frustrated lately that we are dealing with problems that are much bigger than individuals, you know, um, that then we're we're sort of as individuals responsible to solve uh, at a global level, whether it's climate, recycling, whatever, you know. So we're part of all these campaigns now to not like you know, pictures like the one I've shown here of this chimpanzee in pajamas. I mean, this is probably a trafficked animal and we shouldn't be liking it. We shouldn't be promoting it. And we do absolutely all have an individual role, but really we need systemic change. We need to factor in biodiversity loss in policies. Companies need to understand that as a real risk um, that they need to account for. And, uh, and I think without that, it'll be incredibly challenging to address wildlife crime and any other issue that's occurring at a global scale that, you know, as individuals, again, in our aggregate behavior absolutely matters. But these are things that only through whole of government, only through connectivity, only through really working together and driving true change uh, will we make any difference. And I think one of the one of the biggest challenges really and the hardest things about understanding wildlife crime uh, are really are uh, rooted in our cultural biases and and these uh, just a real lack of understanding often of how wildlife crime occurs. It's it's usually about the other, you know, it's occurring in some other space. It's Africa to Asia, you know, it's ivory or rhino horn. When in reality, you know, the folks a hundred miles from me in North Carolina are illegally harvesting turtles and sending them to China, or uh, you know, snake skins being harvested in Indonesia, sent to Europe with lots of illegality in the supply chain. So I think to understand and defeat wildlife crime, we really need to address some of the assumptions that we make about who is, uh, who's operating in the supply chain, how, um, how it works, what animals are involved, what geographies are involved. We need to really broaden our understand our understanding to again, uh, account in a deeper way for the real volume of trade that's happening. Um, 
and I'll, I'll just, I'll end it there. And then I think Joseph's going to have questions at the end. So I'll just turn it over to you guys and see if I can figure out how to stop sharing my screen. Um, Did I do it? I don't know. How about yes. That? Okay. <laughs> yes. So Michelle. thank you. And I'll, I'll wait till the end for questions or comments, if that makes sense, Joseph. Absolutely fine. Tisha, that's a, that was a wonderful presentation. You talked about the organized crime and how it is complex and um, how the connectivity and how data is very important in fighting wildlife crime. Uh, we have a lot of youngsters, a lot of uh, people who are, who are connected to internet the most part of their time uh, for various things here. So definitely the, the, the one of the last slides where you show that uh, Chimpanzees in pajamas. Definitely, a chimpanzee is not supposed to wear a pajama and sleep in a bed. It is supposed to be out there in the wild. And somebody liking it, saying that oh, it's so cute, and that's what actually driving the trade. That is what actually uh, making people to think that okay, I also need a cute, uh, you know, pet like this. We people don't understand wildlife conservation is different from, uh, you know, keeping an. I mean, your measurement of happiness and the measurement of animals' happiness are two different things. Uh, a chimpanzee is probably absolutely happy in the in the in the forest, hanging from a branch to branch. So that is what we should ensure that the wildlife is supposed to be there in the wild, and in the wilderness. So thank you very much, uh, Tisha, for that wonderful presentation. That uh, definitely set the tone for the day and the need for uh, you know analyzing this whole uh, data and connectivity. With that, I I move to my good friend Rickert and his colleague Lionel. Rickard is a senior advisor uh, at uh, International Fund for Animal Welfare. IFO is uh, our international partner uh, in various initiatives, including um, fighting wildlife crime in India. So uh, we, we discussed a lot about wildlife crime with Rickard and his team. And um, interestingly, IFO is one of the pioneering organizations who started uh, investigating the uh, illegal trade in wildlife in the cyberspace uh, starting from the early 2000s and IFA has uh, come out with uh, multiple reports on illegal wildlife trade um, on, in the cyberspace and um, uh, is very much uh, instrumental in setting up a, uh, an international coalition against fighting against wildlife crime. In fact, the word cyber spotter I heard first time in one of the IFA meeting. That is when I actually got the word cyber spotter and uh, over to you, Rickard and Lionel for your, uh, you know, Tell us about your investigations, undercover investigation, what do you call it, the cyber investigations and how, how big the trade is and how serious the trade is. Over to you, uh, Rickert and Lionel. Okay, thank you very much, Jos, um, for the introduction. And thank you, Vivek and Patricia, for setting the stage. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to bring across are already being mentioned, so that's good. I can. I can skip those um, because we don't want to waste too much time. There is a lot to say, and as always, a uh, very limited time. Um, I'm going to talk a bit broader about what I've always doing to tackle wildlife cybercrime, as we call it. Um, you could also call it wildlife uh, crime on the internet, but we call it cybercrime. Um, and then Lionel, my colleague who, uh, who is based in France, I am based in the Netherlands myself. And Lionel will talk a bit more about uh, our site program, our online investigations and research in general. Okay, um, next slide, Lionel. So a little bit about Eiffel. Um, very short, we are an organization 50 plus years old. Um, we work across the globe. Uh, we have 15 offices across the globe. We work in about 40 uh, countries with our projects. Um, and the projects are about uh, landscape work, so our in situ conservation work, which is happening in Africa and Asia, to our wildlife uh, crime prevention work. Um, uh, but we also work a lot on policies in, in, uh, in the international fora like CITES and CBD, uh, CMS and the UN and IUCN, etc. Um, and we translate those policies into national legislation and national laws uh, in the countries where we, uh, where we see that this is necessary to change laws and legislation. 
Um, and then obviously it becomes a matter of compliance and enforcement. So there is, as you all know, a lot to do always. Next slide, please, slide up. So diving immediately into our cybercrime work, um, it has been mentioned already, we've been one of the pioneering organizations and it's, this isn't so long ago. This is 2004 since we published our first report about things that we saw happening on the internet that, that were challenging the way that we were approaching wildlife crime prevention. And 2004 isn't that long ago. So if you look at where we were then and where we are now, it is a tremendous, immense shift that is happening in the way that we have to approach the problem of wildlife trafficking. Enforcers and everyone else, even NGOs, they used to go to marketplaces, you know, shops or open markets uh, where people were meeting each other physically. Um, and that was the, the space where wildlife trafficking was, was taking place, the, the shift from um, the transition from, from the trafficker to the consumer. Um, but to a large, large extent, this shift, how, how demand and supply meet each other has been shifted to the internet. And the internet, as we all know, is open 24 seven. It's open 365 days a year. Um, it's largely anonymous. Um, it's very hard to know who is behind an offering of a wildlife specimen. It's very hard to see if it's legal as Patricia already mentioned. Um, and for enforcers, it's super, super difficult to, to know what's legal, illegal, but also to know who is behind a certain offering uh, on the internet. Um, so that was a problem. Then there was a problem that all the laws and legislations in the countries where we were working were not sufficient to tackle this. The laws and legislations were based on physical markets and arresting people and seizing contraband on the spot and having that as an evidence for, uh, for chain of custody. But suddenly we were dealing with pictures on the internet that were evidence, but the laws were not sufficient for this at all. And to be honest, NGOs like I4 and WTI or anyone else, we were also not equipped to deal with this because we needed to change our systems as well. So lots of obstacles, but also opportunities because suddenly now everyone can be engaged. Like Vivek said, you don't have to go to a physical market anymore. You can actually sit behind your computer and look what's going on on the internet and flag problems to uh, NGOs, to law enforcers, to anyone who can act on it. Um, so that's why we've been setting up cyber spotter programs and Lionel will tell you about this. Um, and why it's so super important that we have those eyes and ears supporting all our work on the internet through a volunteer network. Next slide, please, Lina. I need to speed up a little bit, I notice. Um, so yeah, our approach um, has been research and monitoring. That's, that's what Lina will, will talk about more. Um, policy, I told you, legislation, uh, laws that, needed to be, that need to be changed in order to be able to tackle wildlife cybercrime. Uh, we needed to build capacity of, of law enforcers um, because the kind of policing happening online is quite different than, than, than what you do on a physical market. Um, there was a tremendous, there is still a tremendous amount of consumers that need to be made aware and need to be make, and we need to change their behaviors that they don't buy it. Because a lot of consumers think, hey, it's openly for sale on the internet, it must be okay. Um, but that is in, in many cases not the case. And a very important part of what we've been doing, and I will elaborate, uh, elaborate on that a little bit uh, further, is um, partnering with the online tech companies. Because law enforcers can only do so much. We as volunteers, uh, and we as NGOs can only do so much. A lot of power, that is manpower, but also financial power lies with those big companies that are facilitating the online trade. And they have a responsibility um, and they feel that responsibility and we have to make use of it. Next slide, please, Lionel. So the research and monitoring I'm gonna skip because this is what Lionel is gonna talk about. Next slide. Um, on the policy side, uh, 
uh, we've been first and foremost being active in changing some of the policies, the recommendations uh, that are being used in the international uh, policy space, like CITES, like IUCM, um, making sure that this issue is actually on the agenda and that these larger international institutions are encouraging their members, their parties, to, um, to adopt new legislation and to start enforcing those legislations better in order to tackle wildlife cybercrime. Now, when that is done, and we, we had some successes in it, both in IOCN and CITES, uh, amendments have been adopted. Uh, so wildlife cybercrime is better on the agenda. And then the next step is how do you, how do you implement those recommendations into national legislation? Um, and in the countries where we work, we've been tremendously busy doing this in China, Russia, UK, France, and, and a number of, I think this, this, this list is not even uh, complete yet. Um, this is a constantly ongoing thing where we are making sure that countries actually have the right tools to start enforcing. Next slide, please. Um, then talking about enforcement, uh, there's also first the international steps. So we've been uh, working with Interpol in, um, in creating guidelines for how enforcement agencies can best look at wildlife cybercrime and start to tackle it. Um, we also did with Interpol a dognet uh, investigation, but at the time, and this is about three, four years ago, we didn't find that much illegal wildlife trade on the darknet. Um, so still a lot of the illegal wildlife trade was just happening on the open net. And the criminals didn't feel any urge to do it on the dark net because apparently they had enough space to maneuver uh, without being caught on the open net. Um, so we will keep watching the dark net if things are shifting there. And if it does, it's actually a good, a good sign. It means that we're getting more effective in, in, um, in chasing the criminals. Um, yes, and once, once those guidelines are were fixed, then we, again, it's the same step, we implement those guidelines in, uh, in our trainings with uh, national law enforcement agencies. Uh, we do this in Africa, but we've also been doing it in the US, in China, uh, and in Europe. Next slide, please. Then there is always, you know, the, the challenge and how do we bring the private and the public sectors together? Because I mean, great that, this be, that there is laws, great that there is enforcement. Uh, it's never gonna be enough. We know this. Uh, the problems are always far bigger than the resources that we have to tackle it. Um, so there is this responsibility with uh, the private sector as well. Uh, so we have been organizing workshops where uh, we brought two uh, sectors together, which has been translated into a global wildlife cybercrime action plan. And I encourage everyone on the call to uh, either read it thoroughly or at least scan through it, uh, because it has a lot of books and a lot of uh, important tools that you can utilize um, when you start to tackle wildlife crime on the internet, both working with the public sector uh, the government and such, but also working with private sector, which is then in this case, the tech companies. Next slide. Then another opportunity that we're having, I mean, there's a lot of challenges coming, coming with uh, the shift from physical marketplaces to the online marketplaces for crime, uh, including wildlife crime. Um, there's also opportunities. And one of the opportunities is when you work with the tech companies, the big ones, uh, it can be the Googles, it can be the Facebooks in China, it can be the Baidus and the Alibabas and the Tencents. Um, they have millions and millions and even billions of people that are using those platforms. And while working with them, we have a, a super good opportunity to start influencing the attitudes and ultimately the behaviors of the people that are using those platforms. So you can actually shift it. You can see those, those big platforms where, where demand and supply find each other as, 
as a as a challenging place, which it still is. But you can also shift it towards we can actually utilize those companies to bring out the right message to the consumer. Um, so it's not only a challenge; there's also many opportunities. Next, please. Um, so yes, a little bit more about the private sector. Um, also here, we are, as I for one of the first organizations to uh, have a partnership with one tech company, in this case, it was eBay, that started in 2009. They started to officially adopt uh, policies for their own platforms um, to not allow certain species anymore uh, because the risks are too great. It's too difficult to distinguish legal from illegal. Uh, they were the first to adopt a, a ban on the sales of ivory on that platform. Um, and this is now extended to, to live animals uh, because they say it will not be sufficient to, uh, to look after the welfare of live animals when you traffic over the internet. Um, so there is this constant working with, the, with those uh, private tech companies resulted in, in many bans and better regulations and better uh, information towards the customers that are using those platforms. Now, eBay was the first, but it was quickly followed by Alibaba in, in China. And the list is very long. This is a very short uh, sum up of companies that we work with that adopted uh, all sorts of policies and regulations to better, uh, to be better at preventing wildlife crime happening on their platforms. Next one, please. A little bit more about the coalition. I talked about the coalition to tackle illegal wildlife trade online. This is a coalition between IFOR, my and Lionel's organization together with Traffic and WWF. Uh, we combined our forces. We were both working with tech companies and with law enforcers. And we said, why don't we have a coalition together so we can better coordinate what we do? Um, next one, please. So the approach of the coalition is First of all, uh, policy harmonization so that companies, tech companies online, uh, there is harmonization between uh, the policies that they use. The problem that we're seeing is if one company has new policies and starts to police their platform, you see that it's that has replacement to another platform. Um, and there are many, I mean, there's a couple of big ones, but there's also a lot of specialist websites that are specifically designed for the sales of wildlife. Um, and it's harder to change the policies there because it's their bread and butter. Um, but, but, but when you work with them thoroughly, the things can be done. But it's important that the, the policies are the same, otherwise the trade will go to the point of least resistance. Um, once the policies are in place, you need to train the companies and, and you would be surprised how many people within the bigger uh, companies like Alibaba, Tencent, and Google, how many staff they have employed to, to make sure that what's happening on their, on their uh, platform is actually legal. Um, they're also at risk when things are illegal, so they have to make sure that they have a clean, uh, a clean platform. Um, like I said, there is a, there is a tre tremendous opportunity for user education through these platforms. Um, and then, and that's what we're talking about today more in depth, is the, we can mobilize citizen spotters and, and, and work to work together with these companies. And a final piece is, uh, um, is artificial intelligence. You know, how can we, because it's, it's, as there are so many listings of wildlife on the internet, it really goes into the billions. How can we develop tools to better help us, you know, artificial intelligence tools to better help us to to scan through the internet and to pick out those listings that we see on the internet that are potentially uh, infringe infringements of uh, legislation. Next one. So a little bit of the results of the coalition. Uh, we've been working since 2018, so that's only three years. Uh, already we had more than 11 million posts from illegal wildlife traders were either blocked or removed by the companies that we work with, um, a staggering amount. Some of these illegal listings that we found were being acted upon by law enforcement, but others are well, were potentially, but law enforcement didn't want to act on it. Uh, but we still blocked them and removed them together with the companies we work with. 
uh, we trained over 2000 staff in, the, in those companies. Um, so what did it should they look like? Species identification, what the legislation internationally is, what it is on a national level. Um, what are the things you need to look at when you see something on the internet? Patricia already talked about it. Some things are basically scams, other things are real. Uh, how can you quickly distinguish the one from the other? Um, well, and there's a couple of other numbers here, but just to say that it has, uh, has great success and, uh, um, and it's working. It doesn't come without challenges, but it's working. Next one, please, yes. So here, a lot of logos, the companies that we or at the moment have in the coalition, um, it's quite a lot. Uh, and some of them are also active in India. So I do encourage uh, WTI and others to, to work with us together to see, you know, how can we onboard the Indian offices from these companies in, um, in the same work that we've been doing in Europe uh, and in the US and in, in China. Next one, please. Uh, skipping this one for time reasons. And this one, yeah, this is just this is just one of the online wildlife learning education and training tools that we developed. It's called All It. Um, and it's just to show you that when when you do want to get more involved in, you know, how do I work on the internet to help support law enforcement and support tech companies in tackling this issue. Um, you know, there are some training and, and information um, tools out there that we can help you with. Next one, and I think that's it. Yep, that's it. I give it over to Lionel, and Lionel will go a bit more in depth on our research and monitoring piece. Thank you, Ricards. And uh, that was a great presentation. And yeah, we wanted to like, dive into more details in regard with research because that's also what um, makes sense to you guys with the launch of the Cyberhawk tool. And so we are going just to show you basically what we're doing and how research also intricate with the broader work that we're doing to fight uh, illegal wildlife trafficking on a uh, wildlife trade online. Oh, just sorry. So the first, the key point is that we are, so as an NGO, we are obviously, we have a limited capacity, but we still want to research on, like to target key online marketplace. And we also want to deal that at the global level because like uh, Patricia ex explained it, um, most of the, what is going on on the internet is either transnational or at least global, like every market. Um, as problem and so that's why it's important to tackle it at a global scale and India is also a key marketplace and so that's why it made also so much sense to to have this tool and the work that WTI is doing uh, in India right now around uh, tackling wildlife cybercrime and just to to show you a case today I wanted to yeah just show you more details about what we are doing in China and how like research take place more on a practical standpoint and before diving into more technicalities, I just want to re-emphasize how um, our research work feeds all of the other work we're doing. So in China, like Rickard presented, we are doing some support to policy advancements. We are working with also reinforcers that we fed with also some research. We are engaging with the online platforms, provide some capacity building, and all of this is like also made possible because we have the data and we understand what is going on in the market. So that's why we're doing some online patrolling that we can also then use the content and the analysis with the online platforms. After that, we are also doing some in-depth social media research so that we have more pre uh, precise information and also tailored information that we can then use with the platform, with the enforcers, with the policy makers to make the most out of it. And in terms of research, here is what is going on in China right now um, by I4. We have three different, I would say, activities. So we are doing some regular online patrolling on of common traded specimens, uh, so re relevant to the China markets. 
uh, we are doing that so on a regular basis on 13 different platforms. So that's the platform we are working with so that we can constantly feed those platforms with new insights to also share with them new recommendations so that they can continuously adapt and improve their filtering system, their algorithm to tackle in a better way and most effic more efficient way uh, the illegal listings that are on their website. We are also using an AI uh, tool using based basically images um so that's on a bi-weekly um, basis so that's just on four internet platforms uh, so that is an automatic research and finally the the last activities is the cyber supporter research so we also call it cyber supporter but yeah it's just it's basically using citizen scientists to do also some research because we don't always have the capacity so that's always great to involve uh, the citizen scientists um, and the people like you or like me because I was also a cyber supporter by the way and but, but for those type of research we have a different purpose and I will dive more into detail just after that but basically we target specific platforms we target specific specimen and we conduct like an in-depth analysis over a specific period of time so for example one month so that's not something uh, that is regular but it's more tailored to the needs that we have currently so that we can better address the different challenges we uh, identified and then like from the, those three activities we have a set of suspected illegal listings or posting and also some relevant intel that we can also use so the question now is how do we use it and how do we do we maximize this information so basically we divide the the set of illegal listings that we have into two categories so that's the suspect illegal listings that it that does not have criminal clues and that could interest the law enforcer so those this first part we are uh, also analyzing it but also sharing it with the online platform so that they can remove the contents and they can work on their filtering same as i explained it just before but from the the the, either the, both the intel but the, also the illegal posting that has some criminal clues and that we suspect it might be linked to criminal networks or to the organic crimes we share them with law enforcement agencies and we also obviously work with law enforcement agencies to know what their needs are so that we can feed them with the um with relevant information so that we can like work with them at best so that's what we're doing in china in terms of research now so Rickert uh, briefly mentioned it and I also did but we as part of the coalition have also a project called the wildlife cyber supporter program so the purpose is kind of the cyber org is to use the citizen scientists to to be additional highs on the on the internet and to help us also in terms of um, capacity and so basically we train some uh, citizen scientists to work with us on specific uh, tasks. So the role of the IFO cyber supporter. So I was, um, as I said, I was a former cyber supporter. So that's why also, if you have any question, please ask me and I will be happy to answer it to it. But basically we, our purpose is to reduce the number of endangered wireless specimens offer for sale over online marketplace so we will so cyber spotter it would be like a set or let's say eight uh, volunteers that will work for a period of in france in my case that was six weeks and we had like four hours per week uh, to dedicate for this program and so we were looking at specific marketplaces that we that ifo is working with so that we can also use this information uh, with the platform but also with law enforcement we had some targeted species list so that we are only focusing on certain species to know where to look because that's always challenging on the internet because there are so many different species that are traded cities and also non cities so we did, we made a choice about that and then after uh, recording information we are coordinating then with ifo and also with the online platforms with law enforcement to use this uh information um uh, at best um so yeah and just in terms of target species the the key point is really to tailor your approach base on the context you're dealing with 
Uh, so the target species in Europe are, or would be different in India, it would be different in the US, would be different in, uh, let's say, Southeast Asia, um, because also the dynamics evolve. And so in, in Europe, we decided to focus on all Citis 1 appendix, the Citis appendix 1 species, and some appendix 2 species that were relevant to the European context. And to decide that, we, we had some previous research uh, that we did so that we can, like, it's not a guess, it was based on previous analysis. And basically, to give you an idea what we look for, we look for exotic birds, turtles and tortoises, lizard snakes, and also some ivory. So those were the four categories. And then one volunteer would focus on one category on one website. So that can also, after the training, can also develop his expertise on this subject and really know the website and know where to look and how to look. Um, and the results we had, so it was, we did three different runs of six weeks each. So that's, as I said earlier, that is like just a, not a unique event, but that is like a, a specific period of time. And the purpose is also like to doing that um, every, let's say every two years so that we can make also comparisons of the current uh, state of the online marketplace and what it was two years before. And so we surveyed seven online platforms uh, in France and Germany, and we found over uh, like we reported over 2,700 adverts, uh, knowing that one advert could uh, have 20 turtles, so the number of specimens involved was much higher. Um, but this is just a snapshot because we only had like six to eight volunteers at each round. But the idea is really like to have uh, a good understanding of what's going on certain specimens, and then we can start working with the online platforms who do have the capacity and the financial, both financial and human capacity to monitor at bigger scale uh, what is going on their platforms to deal with that uh, at best. And then uh, what we also have um, is that we also work on some regular patrolling or online monitoring. And I wanted to show you some results we had from regular monitoring in France uh, for a period of five years. Um, so basically, I am working with a, a volunteer that, he, that has been doing for the last five years the same research, uh, one per month, um, on only specific specimens. So that she had only eight specimens to target. I wanted to show you one of them, and the rest of one of them, which is the gray parrots. Um, so why did, did we focus on gray parrots? Because they are one of the most traffic species for the exotic tick pet trades, especially in France and Europe, they go from, yeah, for example, Gabon. Um, and so we also need to tackle what is going in France, so that, like Patricia explained, like we need to also escape or debunk the myth that everything is going from Africa to Asia and then uh, Europe and North America and also other region uh, escape from wildlife cybercrime and so that's why we also developed this regular monitoring uh, in France to also have an MNE tool and then we can also analyze where it's going on and also uh, maybe anticipate some new dynamics and one of the key results of the, the analysis and we also wanted to be able to assess how much impact we had and how much impact of new policy will have on on the offer on the online marketplace we're working with. And just the key outcome of what we found after analyzing the data over the five years is that uh, in early, so only six months, eight months after we start uh, these projects, uh, the um, gray pot was uplisted to the Appendix one of CITES, making them prohibited on the platform and then we work with the platform to also enforce it um, with uh, rigor um, and so you can see with the uh, with the graph uh, that there is a sharp decline on the number of new offer of uh, gray pot on this marketplace so at least it shows that when we uh, work with the policy uh, with policy maker also law enforcers that help with that but and with online marketplace it can really affect the, the offer of gray of a 
specific specimen on a specific marketplace. However, it does not say that uh, Grapeout has not like shift to another platform. So that's one of the limit of this result, but at least it gives us a good understanding of what is going on. Uh, especially that for this platform, this is like the main online marketplace in France. So that's, that, that was a huge achievement. And that's how I will end uh, our presentation because our time is up. And so if you have any question at the end of the, the webinar, we'll be happy to answer them. And thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Lionel and uh, uh, Riket, for such a wonderful in-depth presentation. I'm absolutely sure anybody who is attending this uh, session online across the globe, we have about 80 people attending it online. I'm absolutely sure each one of you understood how serious the challenge is and how big the challenge is and how organized and how established the wildlife crime is already in the internet because we still talk in many workshops and sessions that it is an emerging trend or emerging market. So I would like to emphasize that it is no more an emerging market or it is no more an emerging trend. It is already there, it is well established and it is happening there. So, you know, um, Rickert and uh, Lionel, thank you very much for uh, that wonderful insight into the trade and the work and the approach. And um, this also humbles us that, you know, you guys have done so much there and we are still trying to figure out and starting, you know, probably we are we are scrambling our, our tools and trying to fight it here. So in this open platform itself, I, I request because the ne next step will be, we'll be recruiting a few cyber spotters and uh, um, openly requesting you that uh, there should be some online trainings from your team, uh, by your team to our cyber spotters. I think that's going to be a big, thank you, Rickert, I know. <laughs> uh, so let's take uh, this fight forward and let's fight it now. Uh, let me um, introduce uh, the so-called cyber spotter mobile app which we created and uh, this is uh, definitely uh, uh, our first steps uh, uh, as i said uh, we are scrambling our our tools to fight the crime so first thing we thought is that let's have a platform to fight it and that's why that's why we have this meeting here and asking a lot of people uh, to come and join hands with us so let me share my screen and show you what's it about um, cyber spotter and uh, one of my colleagues uh, uh, will uh, show you, actually walk you through the uh, mobile app and then we'll show you how it works and all. So we'll definitely, uh, you know, would love to hear from you after this presentation. So let me uh, share my screen. Can someone say that my screen is visible? Yeah, it's, yes, it's, it's yes. you can. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, so at Wildlife Trust of India, we started experimenting with the technology a few years back. And uh, Rickard, you must be remembering our bumpy ride from an airport to Periyar Tiger Reserve to start the whole Hawk program a few years back. And here we are, Rickard, after a few years, after four or five years, uh, you know, telling you that, you know, the wildlife death monitoring program is implemented and the crime and intelligence management is implemented. These are two tools which we developed for uh, state forest department to, you know, manage intelligence and manage wildlife crime or manage wildlife death related things. It is already implemented in, in one state and it is, uh, you know, expanding it to a couple of other states as we speak. So, uh, when we finished that, we thought, uh, you know, that's that's for the law enforcement agencies. So we are assisting them to manage the information. So this is like we are developing software tools and systems for them. That's when we start thinking about, you know, we are hearing a lot of things about wildlife crime on um, on cyberspace. And why don't we develop something to, you know, coordinate this? And that's where the whole idea of cybersporter came. And um, actually, as we, we put all of all these tools under the Hawk program, I, I'll say that it is flying out today. So this is our, uh, our uh, uh, initial effort to bring uh, a few volunteers across the country together and uh, fight wildlife crime in, in, in the new cyberspace. So let me tell you what is CyberSpot and CyberHawk, because we are using this terminology and a lot of people discussing with us and asking us what is this. So 
those who are here. So Cyber Squad, it's a virtual network of volunteers. And currently, we are looking across the country. And you may provide information about suspected wildlife trade into the CyberHawk platform, which both we will we will do a small demo after this presentation. You will you will get access to a, a special mobile application or a web interface, which you will be using, which is a secure platform where you can give any kind of information which you come across with uh, in your day-to-day -day life about wildlife crime, whether it is a posting in a social media website or whether it is a WhatsApp group chat or whether it is a Telegram message, whatever it is. And um, so uh, our effort is to collect this information through a set of volunteers. And whatever information we are getting, it will be verified by a set of analysts. My analyst team, we have a small team. A couple of them are there. So they are there. And whatever information you are giving will be analyzed and verified by this, uh, this uh, analyst. These people will ensure that the information is valid. It's, it's fine. Many times you come across with something which you, you think that it is a uh, wildlife crime and you may want to alert. Please alert. I mean, don't think that you know, it is irrelevant. What, what we would like to do is that you know, get, share as, as much as information possible. These people who are trained analysts who know wildlife crime, who know species which are traded, will look into this case, uh, this, look into this pieces of information and they will analyze it. And if there is any actionable intelligence, if there is criminal intelligence, that will be immediately handed over to an enforcement agency for enforcement action. Because the moment we have us as citizen science people, as civil society, the moment we have any credible information, we should be transferring it to a government agency uh, who will definitely take action. And uh, in the past, our, our experience is, is uh, highly encouraging. Uh, our state forest department, our police department, or the National Crime Control Bureau, all of them were very forthcoming. The moment there is an information shared with them, they immediately took action and and brought suspects and uh, you know uh, people who are associated with wildlife crime to justice. So it is an effort from our side to use a platform, connect volunteers across the country, get information, convert them uh, into you know verifiable, convert them into good information and pass it to law enforcement agency for action. So please think that this is not a study, this is not a research. We are not going to come out with too many graphs and uh, reports, but we will definitely looking at getting some work done in the field. I think I have a small technical issue happening. Look, we are talking about technology and my... Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are okay, but my yes, screen is frozen. Some my screen is frozen somehow. Manish, uh, can you take over from here to do the demo? I will come back. I will. I will rejoin. Please uh, do the demo, and uh, then we will go to. Or uh, yeah, that I think that will be better. I think there is a problem with my uh, my system. I'll rejoin. Manish, uh, you can do the demonstration of the mobile app. I think I'm audible. So my colleague will, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry for the technical glitch. Uh, uh, we are talking about you know, using technology to fight wildlife crime and this is what one of the major challenges. Anyway, uh, so we have a backup plan, plan B. So uh, one of my uh, colleague, he will actually uh, do a short demonstration of the mobile app uh, using his uh, connect. Uh, he will connect to you right now. Manish, over to you. Sure. Uh, let me share, share my screen. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible. Yeah. So, uh, as uh, Joe sir uh, already explained, and, and this is basically citizen science initiative, and we will be providing this application to selected participant who will register to a cyber spot network through a proper verification. Only will uh, register them as a cyber spotter. So as we all know, this in recent times there was a tremendous increase in wildlife in wildlife trade in cyber network, and traffickers are connecting to each other using emails, WhatsApp, Facebook, and other social media and online platforms to trade illegal wildlife goods. Goods, and it's increasing in rapidly increasing in India also. So this application is yours. Uh, basically, I'm. Uh, sharing this home screen of the application which you will get after logging to the cyber spotter network 
this hawk application mobile application has provided an easy way to report a wildlife crime and we will be provide it will be uh, easy it will come to the easy way if you saw any wildlife crime on cyberspace you can report it if you saw any wildlife crime in real world you can report here so if you want to report a cyber uh, wildlife crime and cyber wildlife crime so there's a screen here you can see the report crime so you can go to the report crime there so you'll uh, link to this in the next phase which is called report wildlife crime and on ground crime so for the cyber world crime which is happening everywhere in the world you can go use this tab and for the on ground wildlife crime which is real in happening in on ground you are seeing someone selling anything you can report that also so as uh, recently i have an encounter with one wildlife crime pangolin scale trade in youtube so i am uh, choosing this report online crime screen so here we categorize crime in three categories hunting poaching wildlife pet trade and illegal wildlife product trade as you know that many people uh, post the turtle uh, turtles and parakeets for pet trade and they all also post their videos of hunting and poaching you can report the crime as a at, based of their nature of crime and there are many wildlife article available like ivory tiger nail pendant pangolin scales so you can report that in illegal wildlife trade product so it, it is a case of wildlife uh, pangolin scale illegal wildlife product trade so i'm choosing this so then you link to this next phase in which where you can actually add images videos and audio you can screenshot of a, a link and you can take screenshot of a, a chat comments which you are using for trade you can add five images two videos and we are also give, give this audio list here because if you are talking to someone and he gave some information to you you can upload that also then you have to go next here you have to enter the major crime details which were required for analyst to assess and uh, authenticate your crime with it is it good or is it really intel uh, good intelligence or uh, uh, just a source okay so you had you can we have mentioned major largely used shorts facebook instagram twitter and if you spotted crime in other ways you can use others and type the source and you have to give the url so here i spotted the crime in youtube so i'm taking youtube and here i edit uh, url so if you aware that some crime is <clears throat> on some place and you know the area you can just search on the map and add the crime location here so if you are aware of crime species you can search crime species here also and uh, if you don't aware of crime species you can just uh, write down manually here also so is it any suspect some people commented their name contact number mobile number and email address and other details so this is a actually good important details for analyst to analyze and verify the back end of the person so you can give as much as possible and numbers of phone number and email ids and you can write comments so you given this comment you if you come through any other details of the suspect which you have uh, report you just uh, sending a video and uploaded the video on crime you know that this person has other insta handle insta handle and facebook handle you can add that detail here and write something here so in uh, for this all crime report after you report this crime you uh, log in into the system you'll get uid and this so sometimes if you hesitate to show your uid to backhand this is option we added into this to hide your identity so if you'll report as a use sent anonymously it report will come as as a guest so it will not show your user id and what you are so if you want to be in shadow and report a crime you can do it so here i am reporting the crime so when you report the sus suspect species is here is manually types if you will not give this detail these are important detail if you are not give details then it will not report so after reporting the crime you it will generate a unique crime report id which is cr21 u302 so this will help you to get your crime report status which is very important for you to get status of your crime sometimes we reported crime on a uh, social media manager but we didn't know what's happening to you, uh, our report so we have one tab here which is report 
you can go and see the, your reported crime status here. If analyst, backend analyst will re add remark and it will update your status by providing it by analyzing the intelligence. So you can actually able to see here what's happening with your info information. And there's one analyst, uh, my analyst thing tab also. You can see your actually analysis kind of thing, what how many cases you uh, reported from where you reported and how many cases is pending and solved. And the identification tab is also there. So if you wanted to just send us a photo or video to identify the species or wildlife crime article, wildlife trade article, you can send us a, uh, as a, a identification for, you can send us for that also in submit. So this is all we have in front end now. So I request Josa to explain the back end how we in share the information with for uh, enforcement agency how we analyze the information and what information we actually need for to for the process o over to you joseph manish uh, stop your uh, sharing, uh, screen share please okay yeah done sir over to you All right. I think my screen is visible now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, Monish actually gave you uh, uh, an idea how a user can uh, report a suspected wildlife crime. And uh, this is what you are seeing is the dashboard and where you, uh, an analyst is or somebody who is managing the system will see that, okay, uh, this is what is in front of them. So we got 58 users. Some of them are real users. Some of them are test users. We got a, a crime report, 76 crime reports, and a few users are pending. As you know, you know, we will verify each cyber spot, and then only we will get people together. The whole idea of this system, which I could not present in my earlier slide, um, is to have all this information coming from various places, various people, because you will be using you know, Instagram or uh, WhatsApp or Facebook or whatever platform you may come across with some information from a commercial website, wherever it, it is. So wherever you find information, you use the mobile application and send it to us. You don't need to reveal your identity. We don't track any information. And once the information is there, so this is a single platform where we get all this information and then we will start analyzing this information. So for example, uh, let me see what, what my friend just now sent. So there is an online reporting. So we will get all this information, um, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, some of them are already checked, some of them are not checked. So we have options for uh, me. I'm, I'm accessing it as an as a system administrator. So I would like to see what is it. It's just today that we got some information. So let me see what it is. So there is a report ID. So that is uh, CR21 U302. And that is a, uh, that's something from online. There is a product traded and the source is YouTube. So we got some basic information that is somebody so here is he, he is sharing the information i got the photographs i can check the photograph and uh, if he is aware about the url or the url is also given so i can click this url and go there so as of now there is uh, no action taken uh, if you know about the location he can share the location okay that's great so now oh, once we get this information we start a, a set of verifications and then there is an option for the analyst like if i'm the analyst i will actually uh, verify the information, I start giving my notes, like, you know, I verified the picture. Or whatever it is, I, I, I will add a note. So uh, the, the, the system will start noting down all these things because what also we, we also look at is that, you know, when an analyst is working on a case, it will take some time for him to, you know, verify this information, whether it is false, whether it is good, whether it is, uh, you know, accurate, whether it is a reliable information. So uh, as and he progress, he will qualify this information. Okay, this information is reliable, there is accuracy, then, you know, whether this information is old, because sometimes what happens is that we come across with a lot of uh, information where people inform us about wildlife crime happening, but the post was about five years old. So we will see whether it is time bound. So once all these things are verified, because you know we can't give reliable, unreliable information to an enforcement agency. We can't give a, you know a, an information which is not accurate. We can't assess that there is somebody selling uh, ivory in some website. No, we have to 
uh, give in, uh, an enforcement agency very accurate information. So the analyst will do all this analysis and then they qualify this information. And once everything is done, now it is actionable, then the system will uh, uh, will will help you to uh, send an email or you can download a report. I, I'm, I'm not getting into the details of the analysis, but all what you need to do is that just click the email ID, uh, send email, and you can type the enforcement officer's ID and send it to him. So. So I will I will send this email to that person. I'm, I'm, this is a fake email ID. So I'll send this information to the person. So whatever information we are sending will be logged into the system. So over a period of time, we know that what kind of information came to us, what kind of processing is done, what information we send for action, what action is taken. So once we give an information to an enforcement agency, we will definitely follow up and see that what kind of an action is taken, whether a suspect is arrested, then there is another section where we will log all this information that whether a suspect was arrested and whether this, uh, whether any uh, contraband was recovered. So what we hope is that with this kind of a citizen science initiative, with this, this kind of a, uh, enforcement agency assistance initiative, uh, build a repository of uh, you know information and intelligence, which can later, or probably a year down the line or two down the line can be a very big source of open source intelligence because um, as most of you are from India, you know that it is, it's a big challenge across the country. We've got multiple states, multiple languages, multiple types of people, and we are uh, uh, both, an, uh, both a consumer and exporter of illegal wildlife products because we get a lot of uh, illegal wildlife coming into the country as exotic pets. And we do export a lot of animals illegally from our country as live animals, animal products. So all this information, if, if a lot of people, not even a lot of people, if a few hundred people can be cyber supporters and they can give us this kind of information, it can really help us fighting wildlife crime. And uh, uh, in the dashboard, we like any other systems, we have created some analysis, like immediately we will know that what kind of reporting is done. This is still, I would like, uh, let me tell you, this is still in the test phase. It is just launching today. So some of this information is uh, not accurate, but still, you know, looking at the system itself, the analyst can tell you that, okay, what kind of information we are getting from which platform we are getting. Are we getting more information from Facebook? Are we getting information from Instagram? Uh, once we start dealing with thousands of records, thousands of intelligence instances, then this kind of analysis will help us. Then we will know that, okay, which platform is being used in, in India or the landscape largely by wildlife traders, what is happening and what is the progress and what kind of trade is happening, whether it is pet trade is increasing or wildlife product trade is increasing or people are talking about hunting and poaching. So this, this kind of a system, uh, uh, let me admit that we are in the initial stages of the system, but this is what we would like to do and this is where we have to go forward. And I, I, I really need a lot of uh, people, I mean, a lot of people who are attending this already. I, we need a lot of cyber supporters and we will definitely recruit you. And please let me, let me tell you that, you know, CyberSpotter is going to be a volunteer program. So it will be, uh, each volunteer will be screened and uh, definitely you will get trained and you will you will help us fighting wildlife crime. Uh, I'm, I'm stopping my screen share here and uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Mamta, my colleague for the final presentation today. Um, during, Mamta, you can start sharing the screen. Uh, during the course of this development of the software itself, the system itself, we came across with uh, instances of information uh, and we were able to convert them into uh, field level action. So that's already encouraging. And uh, Mamta will just uh, take you through that uh, uh, cases, those cases where the actual information came through uh, CyberHawk. Over to you, Mamta. And uh, this will be a short presentation and then we'll be opening for questions and discussions. Over to you, Mamta. Thank you, sir. So a very good good evening to all the speakers and the participants. So I will just uh, walk you through the results uh, that uh, we could achieve uh, during the test run phase of CyberHawk. So uh, as rightly uh, said by Joseph, we are in the initial stages and we are just taking baby steps. So uh, the test run of CyberHawk application started in August 2020 wherein, um, wherein uh, we involved 50 volunteers 
uh, actually it was 55 to be precise, 55 volunteers from the pool of 210 volunteers which are registered with WTI from across the country. And the task which was assigned by, to these uh, volunteers was to report wildlife crime incidences, uh, be it live pet trade or safe uh, illegal wildlife articles, body parts or hunting, poaching incidences uh, or posts that are uh, there uh, on Facebook, Instagram, uh, or all the leading social media platforms or are there for sale on e-commercial websites. So uh, during this uh, test run phase, uh, we received uh, almost 50, uh, uh, you know, information regarding uh, illegal wildlife on online platforms. Mamta, I think you should uh, put it on full screen. We are not seeing it in full screen. Please. Okay, okay. So is it uh, now on full screen? It is on full screen. You can move to the next slide, please. Okay. Okay, so uh, these are uh, the incidences uh, of illegal wildlife trade uh, uh, that were reported on the CyberHawk application. So you can see uh, on the left, uh, there's a rat snake being sold uh, on Instagram. And uh, uh, second from the left is Alexandrine parakeet fledglings being sold on Facebook. And this is a deal negotiation going on of Hatha Jodi on WhatsApp and a pangolin scale being uh, uh, sold on YouTube uh, through a video. So uh, uh, out of these 50 instances that were reported and they were shared with the concerned enforcement authorities and the state forest departments and they led into nine seizure operations across the country uh, in which uh, there were around 8.9 kgs of pangolin seized in total. Uh, two live Indian flap turtles, which were vulnerable, or according to the ISN red list, were seized, and 30 Hatha Jodi pieces were seized. So, Hatha Jodi is basically male genital organ of a uh, monitor lizard. And the 862 C fan, uh, fan, which is a coral species, were seized, and 744. Uh, like around 75 kgs of ivory articles were seized and four live common sand boa, two red, red sand boa, and one Indian rat was, was seized. So uh, uh, all the participants uh, over here who have joined us, uh, you can also be part of the cyber spotter network and report the incidences of uh, wildlife crime happening on the online platforms. And you can download the app uh, from our website. Um, Thank you for joining us. Yeah, over to you, Joseph, for concluding each. Uh, Joseph, are you? So? So I guess uh, I just left off. Uh, so basically, uh, we are done with the presentation. So we are, uh, Mamta was uh, trying to say that we have so many incidences from a mobile application that someone from sitting from home is sending reporting wildlife crime and from Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, and other social media account. And we have conducted enforcement operation by sharing this intel to uh, enforcement agencies, and which was really good in the trial phase and we need your support to actually join us and to counter wildlife crime which is happening on cyber web and which is very difficult to get actually to uh, negotiate in in person in cyber web so uh, we are now opening for the question and answers if someone has uh, questions some questions to so speak us or, or 
about the app and uh, and backend they can unmute themselves and ask us questions as raised by ali uh, hello yep um yes, thank you so much this is really really exciting the app looks absolutely fantastic um i work for the world parrot trust and we've been sort of sitting on a lot of data from illegal wildlife trade and particularly gray parrots for a while not really knowing what to do with it or who to tell um can i just ask with the um uh, with the Cyber Hawk app, is it going to be just for wildlife crime within India currently? Yeah, it's actually we are running it, this program for now in India only. So we are planning for a global event after we get some partnership with iPhone and something in, in, in expanding our network. We are now very, mm -hmm. have very less net group here for the cyber spotter. So you can you can use the application. You can report the crime from uh, there. Also, we'll try to get involved with international partners. We have international par partners for enforcement operations. Yeah. Hi. Thank That's you, guys. I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm back again. I I had a connectivity issue. Please, I'm sorry for the trouble. All right. Uh, thank you for for answering that. That would be great. Uh, any other questions regarding this uh, all cyber wildlife crime and application and backhand? Hi, everyone. This is uh, Shomudip, Shomudip Mukherjee. Uh, thank you for the great presentation and some. Uh, it's really wonderful to hear from some, some of the people over the globe internationally as well and to understand the cyber uh, space area and also the brilliant app. So uh, a quick question, I mean, we all, all know but as, as a common people, there's a notion like if I report some kind of crime, I be involved. So first question is, how about my identity? If that identity is being disclosed, there is a chance that uh, that person, he or she uh, can be like put into his life, might be in danger. That's number one. And number two is there are situations where people are kind of hesitant to report any kind of crime uh, that because that he or she will be uh, forced into the the, the downstream, uh, what are the legal actions, the legalities from the different administrations, right? So is there something that if you can share that something with us as well? Thank you. Uh, Somadip, let me answer that. Um, uh, yeah, that is one thing which everybody is worried about because many people who come across with wildlife crime or any sort of crime don't want to inform it because they feel that this will lead into further trouble. So that is why we created a, a, an opportunity op option in the app that you can be anonymous. Only you know that what what is the uh, the the code number of the case which you submitted, and we don't know your uh, user details or we don't know your uh, email ID or anything. And uh, so we encourage people to give information anonymously. Anonymously, if you really don't want to give information, uh, reveal your identity. And the other thing is that. Um, Unless and until, if you are concerned about a criminal situation, unless and until you take an initiative to inform it to somebody, um, you may not be able to solve it. So uh, all I can assure from the Cyber Spotter Network and uh, our volunteer program is that no information about anybody who is giving any information about wildlife crime, whether it is you know absolutely real information or if it is uh, not a bit of uh, you know. Um, unreliable information. I mean, you can inform us about anything which you suspect that it is quite left crime, and no information will be uh, shared around uh, so that you will be in trouble. And uh, also, any enforcement agency, there is a rule that you know the source of information or the the, the informant should not be revealed to any, a, under any circumstances. So there is there are witness protection laws in the country and procedures. So you don't need to actually you don't need to worry. You can walk into a police station or a DFS office and tell them that this is what is happening but if there is a practical difficulty or there is a, a, a concern then you can you know you can approach somebody like us who can take it to the authorities and ensure your safety so at any cost uh, the uh, the uh, the person who, who volunteer to give such information will be protected that's all thank you thank you so much thank you so much for the response and definitely i'll be trying to and drop a note to be a volunteer and with whatever my uh, teams and friends and families will definitely share with them. Yep. Thank you so much once again. Welcome, Samadhi. Uh, good evening, sir. I have a doubt. 
I just want to ask, Mayor. Please go ahead. So I have a doubt. Uh, I have a few questions towards it, uh, about the cyber hog and the I force in a I force a collaboration with the industry in the social media platform. First, towards towards you, the what happened if, as you told us, I you told us that we can uh, use a source like Instagram, YouTube, and other sources like photograph. But what happened if if such kind of news could be fake, and this. And how can you handle it? And how can you know that this kind of news can be fake about, about it? That's a new fake fake survey. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Uh, uh, Rikert and Lionel is already there. I'm I'm fielding these questions because most of these questions are from India. Uh, so if, if any any of you have a question which is addressed to any of the presenters like Rikert or Lionel or Tisha, please uh, address them. So there is no problem. Uh, so the, uh, let me answer this question. That, yes, of course, we come across with a lot of information which is fake, which is unreliable. So that is what the analyst's job is, that person who is trained to look into this matter and they will find out whether this information is reliable, whether it is just a fake information or whether it is a, a, a plot to you know do some fraud. So that's always there when you get uh, information, uh, when you get 100 uh, instances of crime, you may get one or two which are uh, absolutely reliable and uh, uh, actionable. So that is what we are also trying to help the enforcement agencies because many times when I discuss with officers, they say that a lot of people send us phone calls, uh, I mean, call us on phone or send us WhatsApp messages or send emails to us, uh, which has got a lot of information which is not, not actionable. There is nothing. It is just fake. So with this kind of a system, what we are trying to do is that we, we are trying to filter that. We are trying to filter this fake, unreliable, not, uh, or, uh, you know, um, not so useful information and uh, send the reliable information only to the enforcement agency. So that, that's the answer. Okay, sir. Now uh, I have another question for uh, uh, Rikert, sir. Yes, uh, Rikert, it is a question to you. Yeah, please go ahead. So, so as you told us that uh, you uh, you have in a, you have an industry collaboration in order to become in order to have a cyber spotting. But uh, as different uh, different companies and different platforms have uh, specific policies like a privacy policies, and what are the challenges that you face during those kind of uh, interaction? How do you support them in that kind of uh, policy advancement? You want to take this one, Lionel? Yes, Rikert. The question yeah. is yours. Uh, I can take no, this. No, one. I'm gonna give it to Lionel. He can give it more. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, I'll take this one. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. I think, first of all, there is, of course, a we need to have a tailor approach and like every country, especially in Europe, like every country has its own set of uh, legislation, like even above the EU regulation. So that is something that we need to take account of. And then that's why we need some like upstream analysis in terms of the legislative framework. And then we can work with the uh, online platforms to also adapt their policy, uh, to have a stricter policy, of course, but also something that is easier for them to enforce. And then we can also like use the cyber support program to also detect some loopholes in their policy so that we can also like then share with them some recommendation and work with them how to fill those loopholes and how to uh, make it a safer place. Um, I hope it answers your question. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, Good. thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else with a question? Hello, it's Devotra Goswami. Um, yes, I have a question. Uh, that is, what about the uh, immediate action or alarming system or alert system by the apps? Because apps will work uh, when we will you know, uh, let you know that it is happening or it is the crime is happening. But what is the immediate reaction or immediate alarming system that, you know, we can assure that it is not happening again or it will, you know, people will get to know about these things. Well, uh, Ms. Goswami, it was not very clear but uh, let me try to answer are you asking that uh, you know uh, can there be a, a, a kind of a live alert system which will prevent yes, a crime yes. from happening yes yes okay. exactly yeah uh, 
my my advice to you is that if you if you are witnessing a wildlife crime or uh, any criminal activity regarding wildlife or otherwise inform the uh, immediate or uh, nearby uh, enforcement agencies whether it is a police officer as per the indian law i i i, I suppose you are from asking this question from india so as per our wildlife protection act uh, an officer above the rank of uh, si uh, sub inspector can take action can take action against uh, can arrest can do the search uh, etc uh, in 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 the situation of a wildlife crime but if if you have a situation where you have to inform any enforcement agency about a crime my suggestion is go ahead and inform any enforcement agency and ask them to prevent the crime you don't need to wait for a mobile app to respond to you so if uh, if you need, if, if the situation warrants uh, an immediate action the best thing is to even call 100 there are a lot of people who actually called 100 and uh, informed the police about a uh, uh, criminal situation and police took action so that's absolutely possible so that's that's it and uh, um, the the apps and the civil society helps comes as the next level like we can further channel the information verify it and you know connect you with a uh, uh, with a, a appropriate agency and uh, take action okay i hope thank i answered you. your question yeah right. thank you thank you for the question anybody else with a question yes so hi yeah. <laughs> so it was really amazing the concept of full cyber hawk however i i'm again my question is an in indian context and i really want to know let's say uh, i'm sitting in bangalore and i'm reporting a crime online on cyber hawk and uh, now let's say this crime is happening in some other jurisdiction in india so how do you go about handing it over to the forest department and are you able to come to know about the jurisdiction where it is happening or you directly go to wccb and like guide them over to or hand them over to go ahead uh well it will be uh, if the information has any any linkage to a particular location uh we have come across with many situations where the information is from the person who is alerting us is sitting in a different city and the the actual crime is happening in a different landscape so uh, that that's the job of the analyst they will verify this information they will try to screen it and they will try to find out because sometimes it is a video and then suddenly there is a sign board the sign board has got some place name we get a lot of such videos like people send a video saying that oh i have seen this this person is selling parakeets on the road side so we try to you know find out the analyst job is to find out the location and uh, then alert uh, uh, most of the cases the the uh, the actionable or verified information goes to wccb and uh, if not it will go to the concerned forest department and we have a good working relationship with uh, this enforcement agencies and we ensure that it reaches uh, the 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 appropriate person at the shortest period of time and we coordinate uh, if there is a, a, a an action needed and once the information is given this is this is something which many people think that you know the forest department or enforcement agencies don't act but my experience is the other way around once you give a, a, a proper information i mean every enforcement agency would love to get something which is clear you cannot just call them up and say that oh there is a you know turtle trade happening in the market that's not actionable information or intel that's just vague information so we we ensure that we give them the exact specific information and ensure that uh, they get uh, accurate intel and then there will be you know immediate action that's what we have seen so definitely that is assured that is why we develop a system like this if we say that all this technology connects i mean today look at uh, with all the difficulties which i am also facing but we are somehow we are connected about 60 70 people are connected and discussing wildlife crime from various parts of the world so we use the same platform to connect and get things done All right. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? I know we overshot a little. Ah, we we got can, another ten. Can you hear me, sir? Yes. Sir, uh, actually, uh, too many videos I found in YouTube, sir, uh, regarding the hunting, uh, then uh, live animal they are uh, hunting and making cooking. inside the reserve forest i already reported to forest department also sir uh, but even even i reported to youtube channel also even though still uh, it's running in the name of uh, the wild cooking uh, some uh, youtube channels the still running sir but uh, uh, in, uh, uh, we found that uh, there is no comments in that sir they are closing the comment box sir uh, due to that we are unable to find uh, who's uh, posting this sir can you please explain sir how to prevent uh, this rajmohan rajmohan i think you are talking about a, a, a famous youtuber 
who who was posting a lot of videos on hunting animals and cooking it from india correct uh, yes sir yes sir yes sir yes, yeah sir. so let me let, let me update you uh WCCD has invested, uh, investigated this case a uh, few months back and you may not be finding any new new posts coming in. That uh, person and his uh, his friends or whomever who was operating this channel is arrested already. If we are referring the same channel, um, uh, that person is arrested and uh, the, uh, the, the videos are still there because YouTube is set to take it down from their, uh, um, their servers. Otherwise, the if you go back and see that, you know, the last postings are about few months back. I don't think that there are new postings. And if we are talking about a different one, please uh, share it with us and we will try to help you and try to take it forward. Because some of these videos which are circulating are few years old or few months old. Uh, so please check what was the last posting and if it is last one or two months. I mean, the 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 the, the arrest, the, 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 the investigation and arrest happened, I think, about two months back. So if there are any new videos, uh, alert us. Uh, we will try to help you and uh, we'll try to take this to the appropriate authorities. But otherwise, uh, this particular channel which you are talking, which has got about 25 lakhs plus followers, is, is the person is arrested and he's, he's understanding what is uh, what is Wildlife Protection Act is. All right, Raj Mohan, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, Trunayan. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, where where will uh, where we will find this uh, app uh, app in Android uh, app app store? So where will you find this app? Trunayan, Trunayan, uh, there will be in the chat box. There will be a, a form which will be shared with all of you, all the participants by the team, and you can fill it and uh, you can download. Uh, you can register it, and then the team will contact you. Uh, okay, okay. I, I know you personally, so I, yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, what we do is that anybody who is applying for this one will be verified because we would like to have a, a reliable volunteer network across the country. So people will be verified and then they will be recruited, they will be trained and they will be, hand uh, they will be uh, you know, monitored and then only we will take it forward. So it is not available publicly in the Android store. Uh, even if uh, you find the links, you may not be able to use it. But uh, we will okay. have a, a, a mechanism to screen and recruit uh, volunteers. Thank you. I hope there are no more questions and I got uh, only six more minutes as per our schedule. And uh, uh, let me uh, uh, let me conclude this. I'm, I'm sorry I could not present uh, my presentation. I will, I will share it with uh, uh, the email IDs which we have. Uh, my team member is asking that why don't we do a percent uh, continue the presentation but i think it's, it's already we, we overshot the time um let me thank each one of you first uh, that uh, it was uh, uh, a wonderful participation and uh, we have a lot of people and a lot of questions uh, and uh, uh, without this participation from all over the country and we just celebrated the Wildlife Week, and uh, we a lot of people were discussing about uh, conservation issues, especially wildlife crime. So this is our humble effort to, you know, initiative to uh, fight wildlife crime in the new world. And let me thank each one of you who are participating first, and you are the most important people here. So thank you very much uh, for sparing your time and coming here. And let me thank uh, uh, Rickard, Tricia, and Lionel uh, for your time and wonderful session. Each one of your sessions were really, really interesting. It actually gave an idea about what is the magnitude of wildlife crime and the seriousness of the crime which, which is in front of us. And that actually enlightened a lot of people who participated today. Uh, I, I sincerely thank each one of you for your, um, uh, for your presentation time. And uh, I am, I'm absolutely sure you will be there to you know, help us to take this forward. I also thank uh, my team, which you, most of you are not seeing. There is a team behind all these efforts. CyberHawk, as, as you know, developing a software, developing a mobile app, took a lot of time, a lot of uh, efforts. So there are developers who developed it. There are uh, There is a small but efficient team who is behind it, who really worked hard to ensure that the, the app is up. And uh, in fact, their work is starting now. We launched it and uh, uh, a few minutes. We already got some... Uh, you know, 
enquiries from potential candidates who would like to become volunteers so the work is actually starting this is not the end this is actually the beginning of it so i sincerely thank my team and finally i thank the organization wildlife trust of india and the people here uh, for supporting us with uh, all the resources all the help and uh, uh, i i hope this will be a uh, the beginning of a, a, a new way to fight wildlife crime thank you once again and uh, 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 mails from us we are just a, a click away you can send us an email you can contact us and uh, uh, one of us will get back to you and we'll take this forward thank you very much thank you everyone have a safe day have a nice day so sir Goodbye. the link is already on chat for the registration of uh, yeah. cyber spotter and or you yeah. can uh, write us on wccd at the rate wti.org.in so we'll share uh, we'll share with the registration form with you thank you yeah thank you thank you everyone thank you record once again thank you trisha thank you thank you to lionel bye thank you thank you so much sir thank you Hello, sir. One question is there. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Please, please. Can I ask please. any? Can I ask question, ma'am? Please. Yes, yes. Ma'am, ma how can we get certificate of this program? Any certificate will provide? No. Uh, no. We are sorry. We are not providing any certificate for this program. It was just to show the cyberhawk application. and how it's work, working and how you can join the cyber spotter network ji 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 no no